Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. I would like to solve a couple of problems related to circuits uh, that contain uh, inductor and uh, capacitor. Um, now, this lecture is basically a continuation. It's, it's problem solving, but it's just based on whatever the previous lecture um, uh, was uh, about, and that's basically about certain formulas which relate uh, inductance, capacitance, uh, and uh, voltage and uh, uh, electrical current in the AC circuit. Um, so all these lectures are part of the course. The course is called Physics for Teens. It's presented on unizor.com. Uh, I suggest you to watch this lecture from, from the website. You just have to follow the menu, uh, uh, Physics for Teens, um, uh, Electromagnetism, and then this is part of the alternate current and induction uh, chapter. Um, now, the website contains not only the reference to a video presentation, but also detailed explanation and calculations, which I'm not going to do here. I'll just refer you to the written notes uh, on my website. Uh, also, the website contains exams for those people who would like to challenge themselves. Um, next is uh, something very important. Um, the Physics for Teens course has a prerequisite, which is Math for Teens, and you can't really do physics without math. And uh, this prerequisite course is also on the same site, unizor.com, and I do suggest you to familiarize with that course as well, or at least with whatever material this course presents. Um, mostly in physics we will use calculus, vector algebra, something else. Okay, so back to problems. So I will heavily uh, rely on the result uh, of the previous lecture uh, and I'll just present certain formula here and uh, if you would like to know how I got it, you have to go to the previous lecture and I assume that you did. Okay, so first of all, what kind of a circuit are we talking about? We are talking about a circuit which has a source, a generator of electricity, uh, alternate, alternating alternate current, alternating current. So that's number one. So we have this source of um, electricity and uh, it has certain um, electromotive force which is variable, depends on time. Now next what we have here is we have inductor. It has certain inductance L. Then we have a capacitor, which has certain capacitance C. And this is our circuit. So, this problem is basically, okay, known certain parameters, we have to uh, determine some other parameters of this particular circuit. And obviously it's all related to certain laws which were derived in the previous lecture. So, let's assume that we have current, which is also depending on time. It's alternating current. Now, in this particular uh, problem, what I have basically um, presented as, as a problem. Uh, we have given certain things, namely um, effective voltage is equal to, what is it equal to? Uh, 20 to 20. Now the frequency is 50 Hertz. So that's the characteristic of the generator. So there is some kind of a rotor which um, rotates with 50 uh, rota rotations per second. And the generated voltage has effective voltage is 220 volt. Now you remember that effective voltage, if you have a sinusoidal 
um, waves E of t is equal to E0 times sine omega t. That's how we describe our um, EMF, electromotive force, where E0 is a peak voltage, so effective voltage is E0 divided by square root of 2, and I have derived this as well. It's basically you are averaging the square of, um, uh, of, of this sinusoidal voltage. So that's given. Effective is given. Well, which means peak is also given in this particular case. It's just square root of 2 greater than this one. Now, what's next is, I have the effective current. It's given. I effective, it's 5 ampere, right? Right. Now, you remember, now let me go back a little bit, again, from the previous lecture, I have derived that the current as a function of time is also sinusoidal, but it's shifted relative to um, uh, voltage. Its phase is shifted by pi over 2, um, which means the formula would be cosine omega g. So it's also sinusoidal, and the effective is exactly the same type. It's peak divided by square root of 2. Again, everything is in the previous uh, couple of lectures was presented. So that's given. So we have effective voltage, we have eff effective current, and we also have a capaci capacitance. What is it? 10 microfarad. Okay, 10 microfarads. Micro means one millionth of farad. Farad is, a, is actually a very big unit. So that's given. So what I have to de de determine is inductance of this particular uh, inductor. Okay, it's kind of a lot of different variables, etc. In, in, in theory, it's a very simple problem. Because all these characteristics are connected through um, certain equations which were derived in the previous lecture. <coughs> so, you remember there is a concept of reactance. Uh, reactance for a capacitor and reactance for inductor. They are kind of similar to um, uh, resistance of the resistor. And basically there is a similar formulas actually, um, which um, connect the voltage, the uh, amperage, and reactance in this particular case. So the main formula, which was derived in the previous lecture, was the following. It's very much like Ohm's law for a direct current. So this is the peak voltage, this is the peak amperage, and this is the difference between uh, reactance of the capacitor and reactance of the inductor, where inductance are defined as where omega is the same omega here. This is angular uh, velocity in, in radians. By the way, how is angular velocity in radians 
is related to frequency. Well, frequency is number of rotation if each rotation is 2 pi, right? So if you want to, to do it in radians, uh, my omega is equal to 2 pi times f. So, using this and this, and obviously this, we have everything known in this particular thing except XL, which is directly related to uh, inductance. So if I will just substitute whatever I have in this formula, I will basically have an equation which I should solve to get the L. So let's just do it. Well, first of all, um, you see I0 and uh, E0, which are peak voltage and amperage, are related to effective only by uh, the same factor, square root of 2. So if I know E, effect, uh, e effective and I effective, I can actually divide this by square root of 2 and this by square root of 2, and I will have exactly the same formula, I effective equals E effective divided by xc minus xl, right? Because it's just divided by square root of 2 both sides. So now I have everything actually here uh, known, and the only thing which I have to do is replace E effective. Now xc is this one, which is known, 2 pi c, right? Uh, 2 pi fc, sorry. Frequency times capacitance. Minus, this is xc, minus xl, which is 2 pi f <coughs> L. Basically, that's it. This is the final equation. Everything is known here except L. So, how can I basically do this? Well, that's just plain algebra. Um, so, I will have 1 over 2 pi F c minus 2 pi f l equals e effective divided by i effective. From here, this is a linear equation for l, so all I have to do is put this one to here, this one to here, and divide everything by 2 pi f. So it would be 1 over 4 pi square f square c minus e effective divided by 2 pi f i f and this is equal to l. Am I right? So this thing goes here, this thing goes here, and I divide everything by 2 pi f. Yeah, that seems to be an answer. All you have to do now is substitute all these numbers, which I'm not going to do right now, but I did do it in notes for this particular lecture, so I do recommend you to read the notes, which basically has the same uh, kind of calculations coming up with equation which you just have to solve and that's all presented on, in, in notes for this lecture. Well, that's it for this problem. So again, the problem was to define one particular, to determine one particular characteristic if everything else is known. Obviously, since it's all related, there are other problems which can be imitated exactly from this one. So let's say if L is known and C is unknown. Well, the same basically approach. What if L known and C known and you have to determine uh, the current? Again, it's all related in one particular equation which looks very much like the Ohm's law because this is the voltage divided by something which is kind of equivalent to resistance 
and you get the current. Except that in AC, in alternating current, we are talking about either the peak values or the effective values. And this is basically equivalent to a resistance of the whole circuit with reactance of capacitor and reactance of um, uh, inductor. And by the way, reactance is actually measured, unit of reactance is also ohm. I mean, if you will go again back to the lecture which explains the concept of reactance, you will see that the unit of measurement is actually ohm. And the resulting uh, um, inductance so I said reactance. Reactance is at ohm. Now inductance is measured in Henry, and that's what you will get if you will put all these numbers into this formula. You will get the the answer. How much Henry is the inductance of this particular inductor? Okay, this is all about this problem. It seems a little complicated, but in theory it is not, because all you have to really know is the definition of certain um, characteristics of of the circuit, like inductance, capacitance, reactance of this, reactance of this, effective voltage, effective amperage. So if you know all these concepts and you know this main formula, everything else is easy. Now, the next two problems actually are very, I would say, qualitative, not quantitative. They basically explain the concepts um, a little bit more of inductors and capacitors. So consider the following uh, circuit. You have a capacitor and parallel some kind of consumer of electric impulses, electric signals. Um, in theory, it can be something like a radio. Now, why I'm talking about a radio? Because <coughs> on the input, I don't have just a very nice sinusoidal uh, signal, but I have something which is really like a noise. Now, what is noise? Well, consider you have one generator which generates certain uh, variable um, alternating current of certain voltage and certain frequency. And then you have another one parallel to this one. So you have one and then you have another. But this guy has a different frequency and different peak voltage. And what if they are connected together as a source of electricity. What you will have here on this some kind of a um, device? Well, you will have a mixture, right? You have two sinusoids, which are not exactly a sinusoidal wave. It's a combination. It's a mixture of different signals of different frequencies. What if you have not two, but a hundred? Well, you will have a mess. You will have a, almost like a white noise, what they call it. So all these signals are coming, if you're talking about, about, for instance, radio waves, they are from all different sources. Sources have different um, frequencies, different amplitudes. Um, so you will have a noise. So that's basically what here we have. So we have some kind of a noisy signal. Now, but my point is that provided such a noisy signal. But I would like to say that if you don't have this capacitor, well, all noise goes to our device, right? If you do have this capacitor, then the high frequencies of this noise, and again, noise is a combination of different frequencies, so the high frequencies will actually uh, be uh, um, going to this particular device in, in, in less power. So certain amount of energy which high frequency are carrying with them will be 
going through this chain rather than through this chain. So, without it, every single all the power goes here. With this, certain amount of high frequencies will go here and will be, 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 will be weakened here. So, it's actually like a filter for high frequencies and this filter is taking upon itself certain amount of energy with high frequency and that weakens the high frequencies uh, from this white noise which are going to uh, this particular uh, device. Now, question is why? Well, very easily. It's, it's actually more explanation than, than the reality here. Again, remember reactance of the capacitor which is equal to 1 over omega c. c is a capacitance of the capacitor. It's, it's a characteristic basically which depends on um, uh, the area of, the, uh, of these two plates and the distance between them and what's in between them, what kind of um, insulating material is in them, etc. This is the characteristic of the... it's given. It's constant. Now, this omega is very important. You see, the greater omega, omega is angular, uh, uh, angular velocity, which is actually proportional to, to the frequency. Omega is equal to 2 pi f, uh, f. So, the greater the frequency, the smaller um, reactance of this capacitor. So, if this thing is relatively functionally equivalent to resistor so you have a resistor here a resistor here now if you have this resistor uh, uh, being smaller and smaller it means that the greater and greater current will go this way than this way because if you remember in this parallel um, uh, circuit uh, the currents are inversely proportional to um, uh, resistance. And it's obvious from the you know, pure logical standpoint if this has certain resistance and this has certain resistance. So the, the current goes here and here. But if this resistance is getting smaller and smaller, when the frequency is increasing, this resistance is getting smaller and smaller. Well, I shouldn't say resistance, I should, I should say reactance, because we're talking about um, a capacitor. But a functional resistor, resistance and reactance are the same. So the more uh, current of these high frequencies will go here, and this uh, high frequency will be uh, weakened on this particular uh, device. Okay, that's hopefully it's understood. The same thing, basically, if you have, let's say, flow of water, and that flow is branching like a Y uh, letter. Now, if resistance in, in some way is equivalent to the width, right? So if you have this thing, and then it splits. Now, the resistance is... Um, equivalent to the width. The greater the width, the less resistance, right? So, if you will increase the width of this, then more water will go here and less water will go here, right? So, that's exactly the same thing with currents, with electrons, because, you know, what is current? Current is the flow of electrons. So, same thing, they, they, they basically obey the same kind of a logic. So, the smaller reactance of the capacitor, the greater energy will go here. And obviously the high frequencies give you um, smaller reactance. And then more, so in the higher frequencies um, you will have more uh, energy going through this than through this. It weakens the high frequency, it filters out the high frequencies from this white noise um, as they are coming into this particular um, device. Great, that's my second
kind of a qualitative prob problem. And now my third qualitative problem is related to this. What if instead of capacitor I have an inductor? Inductor also has its own reactance, right? And that's omega L. So in this case, as you see, the lower frequency corresponds to lower reactance. And again, lower reactance means that these um, uh, low frequency um, uh, oscillation of the current will go more to this device and will be filtered out from this device. So this is a low frequency filter, so to speak. Um, so capacitor will filter out high frequencies, uh, inductor will filter out low frequencies. By combination of these two filters and properly um, calculating what exactly capacitor and what exactly inductor should be used, we can actually narrow um, the um, oscillations, the frequency of oscillations which are coming to this particular device very um, to, 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 to very narrow actually interval. And that's how the tuning actually is um, obtained in, let's say, radios or whatever else, whatever devices is using. Um, so this is very important kind of connection, so to speak. And it's a very important quality of capacitors and inductors. And um, on a similar note, I can also mention that we all know the dimming um, uh, switches. You're just moving certain slide and the lights go up and down, right? So how can that be accomplished? Well, again, the same thing. You can actually do uh, something like an inductor. Inductor is easier to, to change the uh, inductance because you can just shift the contact. This contact can be floating, right? And the shifting it, you will change the number of um, uh, loops of this particular inductor. And obviously, the greater the number of loops, the greater inductance, the smaller, the smaller. And that's how you can actually change the inductance. It's easy. And uh, changing inductance, you can actually change something which is an equivalent of um, uh, resistance. So in this particular case, you can include into the loop an electric lamp let's say it's, a, it's your electric lamp incandescent lamp so changing this uh, inductance will basically change the effective uh, current which goes to this particular lamp so that's another property of um, inductance which you can use here well, basically, that's it. These are kind of three problems which I wanted to present um, after analyzing what LC circuits actually are. Um, I do suggest you to read the notes for this particular lecture, and there are m maybe a little bit more detailed explanations of these two qualitative problems, so to speak. Um, and, uh, well, that's it for today. Thank you very much, and good luck.